Distinguished participants, friends, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this high level segment of the global dialogue on the role of food and agriculture in the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. I'm David Cooper, the Deputy Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity, and I have the honor of co-facilitating this second panel discussion on the Global Biodiversity Framework, supporting biodiversity for food and agriculture, recent initiatives and approaches. I'll be facilitating this session together with my friend and colleague, Eduardo Mansour of FAO. As you know, this global dialogue is being convened jointly by FAO and the Convention on Biological Diversity. And on behalf of the Convention Secretariat, I'd like to express our deep appreciation to FAO for organizing this event together with us and for our long-standing cooperation. I'd also like to express appreciation to all the presenters and panelists so far, and indeed to all the participants for the excellent inputs and lively discussions we've had over these two days so far. You'll have heard an interim report earlier today, and the co-chairs will provide an updated report at the end of this session. The lively discussion so far has reinforced what we know to be true. Food and agriculture, crops, livestock, fisheries, aquaculture and forestry, all depends on biodiversity. And all aspects of biodiversity, from genetic resources of crops and livestock to soil microbes, from pollinators to the natural enemies of pests. This biodiversity, and the way we manage it is important for agricultural productivity, for sustainability, and to ensure nutritious foods and a healthy planet. And this means that when we look at the future of biodiversity, including when we look at the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, nothing is more important than the way we manage these sectors. Everyone is involved, businesses, farmers and fisher folk, and in, in particular, let's not forget the importance of small scale farmers and fisher folk in providing us with most of the food we consume. And of course, all of us who depend on these sectors for food. To meet the goals and targets of the new framework, and indeed also to meet our climate goals and to meet the sustainable development goals, we'll need to transform the way we manage food and agriculture to ensure that not only will it meet the increasing demands for food, but also do so sustainably. This issue will be central to discussions at a number of summits this year the upcoming UN Food Systems Summit and the, and the pre-summit, they'll also be hosted by FAO shortly, the Climate Conference, COP26, and of course, uh, above all, in terms of this meeting now, the UN Biodiversity Conference, COP15, due to be held in Kunming, China, uh, this, this year. And that leads me to introduce our first speaker. And indeed, we're very honored to have with us at this meeting, ministers of environment and agriculture from a number of countries who are playing a leading role in integrating environment and agriculture. It's a particular honor and a privilege for me now to introduce the incoming president of the Conference of the Parties of the Convention on Biological Diversity, his Excellency Minister Huang Ruchu, Minister of Ecology and Environment of the People's Republic of China. Minister Huang and his colleagues have been tireless in their efforts to prepare for COP15 
in the beautiful city of Kunming in Yunnan province, the most biodiverse and ethnically diverse part of China. The plans have had to change as we struggle to adapt to the ongoing uh, pandemic. And therefore we're especially grateful for these ongoing remarkable efforts to prepare for this meeting. So let me introduce uh, the Minister for Ecology and Environment, the People's Republic of China, Your Excellency uh, Wang Runchu, you have the floor. Hao 真是其对可持续发展的重要意义各类自然保护地面积也超过了一百七十二万平方公里在为全球生物多样性治理方面确定了会期主题会标和网站受疫情影响啊呃水滴形状的一个会标 中国将以东道国政府名义举办高级别会议，邀请地位方部长级官员出席，期待高级别会议通过东道国主导的政治宣言，也就是我们说的昆明宣言，为大会谈判发挥好政治引领作用。三是有序推进各类平行活动的筹
，将其视为扭转全球生物多样性丧失的重要节点。我认为啊，有以下几点是非常关键的：第一，要凝聚合力，提振雄，提振雄心；我们要坚持多边主义，加强政治推动和国际对话合作，推动各方相向而行，求同存异，凝聚共识，达成。兼具雄心和务实的二零二零年后全球生物多样性框架，提振全球生物多样性保护的信心。二是要调动资源，加强协同，要以联合国生态系统恢复十年和二零二零年后框架为契机，积极为自然和生态系统保护与恢复啊，调动资源，加大投入，充分发挥自然和生态系统。在应对气候变化、生物多样性保护、粮食安全、健康等挑战方面的协同作用。三是加快变革，务实行动，要将生物多样性保护置于全球和各国政策制定和实施的优先级位置，在粮食系统、基础设施投资、建设。能源、土地利用等方面，采取有效的措施，推动实现转型变革。COP 十五的主要目标成果是达成二零二零年后框架，为解决全球生物多样性丧失问题提供新方案，描绘新蓝图。生物多样性保护与全球可持续农业和粮食安全相辅相成，这个框架。已将农业生物多样性置于重要的位置。我们期待联合国粮农组织和生物多样性公约秘书处啊，开展更为紧密而且富有成效的合作，共同推动全球生物多样性保护和农业的可持续发展。我想借这个机会啊，给大家传递这样一些信息，和讲这一些这样一些个表达我们的。意愿，感谢大家，谢谢。Thank you very much, Your Excellency, Minister Huang.、Um, thank you for outlining the remarkable efforts、um, China has undertaken to protect and to. Sustainably use its biodiversity to restore its lands,、um, to expand protected areas and ecological red lines, all contributing towards building a, an ecological civilization. And thank you for updating us on the preparations for COP15.、Um, we are all looking forward、uh, to be able to celebrate COP15、uh, in Kunming. Uh, and to move towards adopting the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. And above all, thank you for the call for action by all countries at the national level and at the global level、uh, to move forward with our multilateral、uh, and national、uh, our multilateral collaboration and our national implementation to ensure that we meet our goals. The road to Kunming was. Thank you, Shui Shui. The road to Kun. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Uh, I, I also very hope that we can move fast, 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 that And of course, the the road、um, to Kunming was set at our last meeting of the Conference of the Parties in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt, COP fourteen.、Uh, indeed, when we established together China, Egypt, and the Secretariat, the Sharm el Sheikh to Kunming Action Agenda, and. The 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 road to Kunming, the preparation of the post 2020 global biodiversity framework, was organised 
thanks to the efforts of the Egyptian presidency, and I'd like to pay tribute to the um, efforts of Her Excellency Dr. Yasmin Fouad, um, Minister for the Environment uh, of Egypt, um, who has continued to play uh, an important role as we move towards COP15. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Fouad has been called into a, a cabinet meeting and is unable to join us uh, at this moment, but she um, <laughs> he's going to present a message. The message will be presented by her representative uh, and our good friend, Dr. Hamdala Zedan. Uh, I would like to also pay tribute personally to Dr. Zedan for his leadership of the Conference of the Parties in this challenging time for us all, this challenging time uh, uh, of the convention as we prepare for COP15. Um, so I now have the, the pleasure of inviting Dr. Hamdala Zedan to speak uh, on behalf of Dr. Her Excellency Dr. Yasmin Fouad, Minister for Environment of Egypt. Hamdala, you have the floor. So, I understand, um, yes, I understand that Dr. Zadan will be joining us in a moment. Um, meanwhile, I would, we'll uh, proceed with the, the agenda. Um, this is the second global dialogue co-organized by FAO and the Convention on Mainstreaming Biodiversity in the Agricultural Sectors. Um, and this process of, of mainstreaming biodiversity in FAO and more broadly was given a sharp reinforcement at COP13, which was hosted by Mexico in 2016. Uh, in Mexico, at the high-level segment, um, we discussed the mainstreaming of biodiversity in agriculture, forestry, fisheries, and tourism. I now have the pleasure to invite the Deputy Secretary of Planning and Environmental Policy of Mexico, Jorge Arturo Argueta Villamar to make some remarks. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Muchas gracias, eh, David. Muchas gracias. Eh, buenas tardes en Roma. Estimado señor director Xu Yu Dongi, director general de la FAO y estimada Elizabeth Maruma, Secretaria Ejecutiva del Convenio de la Diversidad Biológica. Respetables panelistas y colegas, reciban un cordial saludo de parte de la maestra María Luisa Albores González, Secretaria de Medio Ambiente del Gobierno de México, quien me ha pedido compartir con ustedes una, eh, las ideas básicas de la política nacional sobre la relación entre diversidad biológica, alimentación y agricultura. México es un país megadiverso, tanto en biodiversidad como en diversidad cultural y lingüística. Ambas diversidades propiciaron la domesticación de plantas y animales, como ocurrió en varios puntos del planeta, pero especialmente en ocho centros de origen y domesticación, llamados también Centros Babilov o Centros Babilov Har Harlan. Desde esos tiempos ancestrales, una gran cantidad de las variedades domesticadas, incluso algunos de sus parientes silvestres, se mantienen por el eficaz e inteligente manejo 
que de ellas hacen los pueblos campesinos y pastores del planeta, generando nuevas variedades mediante la selección paciente y la domesticación, procesos que continúan hasta el día de hoy. Ante este legado biocultural de enorme trascendencia, el gobierno de México reconoce la importancia de la biodiversidad para la alimentación y la agricultura nacional y global, por lo que dentro de la planeación nacional se han diseñado estrategias y acciones vinculadas a su protección, conservación y uso sustentable, así como para transitar hacia la soberanía alimentaria. Un elemento fundamental que se eh, dio a conocer en la COP eh, Cancún 2016 y que todos ustedes eh, deben saber, es que el 80% de los ecosistemas en buen estado de conservación, en donde se concentra gran parte de la biodiversidad, es propiedad social y colectiva y pertenece a comunidades rurales e indígenas. Esto muestra la importancia de estas comunidades y de los territorios que ocupan para la conservación de la biodiversidad y su gran aporte en servicios ambientales a la agricultura y a la alimentación en México. El Programa Sectorial de Medio Ambiente y Recursos Naturales incluye diversas estrategias, como lo señalábamos hace un rato. Señalo dos o tres de ellas. <coughs> eh, Estamos diseñando eh, acciones e instrumentos, programas que apoyen la gestión de sistemas agroecológicos, agroforestales y agrosilvopastoriles en el medio rural y periurbano. Y estamos también impulsando una política integral de bioseguridad que salvaguarde la biodiversidad a las personas y a la inocuidad de los alimentos de los efectos adversos de los organismos genéticamente modificados y de plaguicidas, que sean, eh, plaguicidas y herbicidas que se han aplicado de manera indiscriminada en nuestro territorio. Con base en ello, se trabaja en los territorios para incentivar la transición agroecológica, así como el respeto y la conservación del patrimonio biocultural del país a fin de proteger la salud y la vida de los mexicanos ante las amenazas ya señaladas. Se impulsa por ello una nueva ética de producción y consumo de alimentos en los territorios para la consolidación de un sistema agroalimentario justo y sostenible. Se trabaja de manera conjunta cinco secretarías del gobierno federal, eh, salud, medio ambiente, agricultura, bienestar, economía, y el Organismo Nacional de Ciencia y Tecnología en una agrupación denominada GISAMAC, justamente con este propósito estratégico general. Eh, reconocemos la importancia del liderazgo de la FAO en los sistemas importantes del patrimonio agrícola mundial, los CIPAM, para impulsar los numerosos sistemas agroecológicos ancestrales que existen en México y con ello apoyar a las y los cultivadores, pastores, pescadores, eh, que han hecho posible la conservación de las especies y el enriquecimiento de la biodiversidad y la agrobiodiversidad en México. México reconoce también el rol estratégico de la FAO y del Convenio de la Diversidad Biológica en la transversalización de la biodiversidad en los sistemas de producción agrícola, pecuario, forestal, pesquera y acuícola para asegurar el bienestar humano y alcanzar las metas de siete de los eh, 16 objetivos del desarrollo sostenible. En días recientes se han tenido las reuniones del órgano técnico y científico y del órgano subsidiario sobre la aplicación del convenio de la diversidad biológica. Ahí hemos subrayado una política de respeto a los derechos humanos, especialmente de las comunidades indígenas y locales, y hemos enfatizado la soberanía sobre los recursos naturales de la nación, como lo ha señalado el presidente Andrés Manuel López Obrador. Estamos retomando entonces una política internacional alejada del paradigma neoliberal. 
La presente celebración abre además la puerta a dos nuevas décadas, la de la ciencia de los océanos, la restauración de los ecosistemas marinos, y eh, estaremos eh, en octubre adoptando en China el marco global de biodiversidad como otro paso para la, lograr la visión 2050 de vivir en armonía con la naturaleza o como lo ha señalado el señor Hung, de reconstruir una comunidad de vida. Reiteramos el compromiso de trabajar a favor de la biodiversidad y de los pueblos, de la alimentación y de la agricultura que mantienen el bienestar en nuestra sociedad. La naturaleza es nuestro origen, es la sabiduría y es la salud de nuestros pueblos y la vida misma. Muchísimas gracias por la invitación y su atención a estas palabras. Muchas gracias, señor Agüeta Velamar. Muchas gracias para enfatizar uh, la importancia de la biodiversidad y los centros de origen. Muchas gracias a México por todos sus esfuerzos de integrar la biodiversidad en los sectores de la agricultura, la pesca, los bosques y por su apoyo importante en estos uh, procesos multilaterales uh, uh, en, la, en la FAO y otras. Y tam también por el liderazgo de México, de Ezequiel Benítez, de Conabio, uh, por el papel importante en el órgano subsidiario, uh, el SOBSTA. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before we move on, to um, to other speakers, I, I'd like to note that uh, we will have some time for discussion um, and for some questions uh, and answers. So uh, please uh, use the question and answer um, box if, if you have questions that you would like to, to raise uh, for any of the panel members uh, today. And I uh, will see if we um, have any, any questions. And if not, maybe um, I will um, pose a question if either of our distinguished speakers uh, are able uh, and, and in, uh, to, to address uh, mm. these questions of looking forward, what are the key mm. elements that we need in a global biodiversity framework that could enable integration of biodiversity in the agricultural sectors, the sectors of agriculture, forestry, uh, and fisheries. Um, I don't know if either Minister Huang or uh, Deputy Secretary Agueta Villamar would like to uh, address this, this question or give us any other thoughts they may have uh, as we move forward on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Uh. Yeah, yes, please. Uh, Your Excellency, please go ahead. Uh, I think, I think, in the future, how to develop in all areas, especially in the farming sector, to be able to have a good effect on the environment. In this area, I think, I 生物多样性保护对我们的生存和发展是何等之重要。
呃，自然可以没有人类，但人类离不开自然，所以人人与自然和谐的话，是我们人类生存发展的必然要求，各个方面都是如此，各个方面都是如此，所以我觉得这一点的话是一定要说清楚的。第二的话呢，我觉得要呃更多的找到一些个路径，能够实现呃在各个领域的这种沟通，呃，比如说在呃森林也好，在农业也好，在呃自然生呃文文化也好，怎么样和生物多样性能够有机的衔接？我认为的话呢，中国在这方面有很多好的实践。你比如说，我们呃这一次 COP 十五，我们准备在我们已经定下来，在中国的云南，呃这个地方的话呢，是一个非常美丽和神奇的地方。我们说它美丽和神奇的话呢，呃除了它有。很丰富的呃自然资源，有很丰富的自然生物多样性以外，它还有很丰富的文化多样性，有很丰富的呃这个食物粮食的多样性。你比如说这个地方的人，他可以呃用利用生物多样性的方方面面，比如说作为我们的食物啊，呃这个地方的蘑菇就是菌类啊，呃是这个地方的很大的一个老百姓的。蔬菜的来源 ，OK， 所以我认为的话呢，像这样一些个呃生物多样性为我们人类提供各种各样的服务和各种各样的这个资源的话呢，我们要充分重视。这样的话，找到这样一些渠道的话呢，可以更好的既满足我们呃多样性、生活的多样性、文化的多样性、生物多样性的需求，又能够持续推进我们呃生态系统的呃完善和稳定。我就想说这些。Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Minister. And I, I, I believe uh, His Excellency, the, 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 the Deputy Secretary um, for Mexico, would also like to, to respond. Dennis um, Lapalapa. Por favor. Muchas gracias, eh, David. Um, lo, lo señalado por el eh, eh, ministro Hong me anima ex exactamente a señalar eh, la enorme importancia del de tema cultural y biocultural en el binomio biodiversidad alimentación. Eh, la alimentación misma es un acto cultural. No podemos separarlo de lo que ha sido eh, las tradiciones alimentarias en el planeta. Entonces, eh, sí, efectivamente, Hunan, eh, igual que en México, una alta biodiversidad enorme. Es la más importante en China, en esta región, eh, al sur de de, de China y en la frontera con Tailandia, con Laos, y también una gran diversidad eh, biológica, una gran diversidad florística, es impresionante. Tienen más, más eh, del 30% de la flora de China está justamente en Hunan. Bueno, eso es importante y en México tenemos una situación similar. En, en una reunión anterior, eh, el doctor Carlos Manuel Rodríguez, nos hizo la pregunta de si era mejor ser ministros de medio ambiente o ministros de agricultura, que qué escogíamos. Eh, yo contesté que había que hacer eh, ministros de ambos, que había que unir agricultura y biodiversidad. Como no se puede hacer en términos eh, estructura, de estructura, sí se puede hacer en términos de planeación. Y yo creo que el enorme esfuerzo de Kunming debe desembocar en este programa de, de la, del marco eh, general eh, para la biodiversidad y la alimentación en programas eh, globales apoyados interagencialmente que justamente eh, permitan eh, estructurar relaciones entre ministerios de medio ambiente, 
agricultura y cultura. Justamente yo creo que sería innovador establecer programas interagenciales globales que permitan esos acercamientos. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, uh, subsecretario. Um, I think in this segment we have time for uh, a couple of more questions. Um, and I will, we have some questions uh, from participants. Um, and I think for uh, Minister Huang, there is a question from uh, Eshmael Karamida Kodi. Um, Thank you for the distinguished panel members. I would like to ask what was the role of academic institutions for biodiversity management in China? How can we support the contribution of these institutions for international collaboration? Um, and so I think um, given the COP is going to take place in China and, and China has this immense uh, capacity uh, in its academic institutions. Uh, you may wish to address this question. And then I will have a question for, um, for our, our Mexican vice, vice minister uh, from Angela Cordero. Um, uh, uh, Mexico, as, uh, 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 as you said, Mexico is an important center of origin for, for many crops such as maize, um, could uh, Mr. Villamar uh, outline some of the, the policies that Mexico uh, and others take uh, to protect this agricultural biodiversity? So first I'll turn to uh, Minister Huang um, to address the question about academic institutions. Uh, you, you have the floor, Your Excellency. Thank好,非常感谢您提的这个问题,我觉得这个问题的话,说大它也很大,说小它也很小,说大的话呢,确确实是我大到我很难用一个准确数据来回答你,中国究竟有多少生物多样性的研究机构,因为实在是太多了。那说它小的话呢，你也可以说，呃，这个，呃，这个，呃，非常非常多，它它也是可以来表述这个这这样来表述这个问题的。那我想的话呢，呃，在中国和生物多样性有关的机构，大致可以分为四类。一类的话呢
他的农业研究所，他就会农业科学研究院，他就会研究长江里面的江豚，研究水里面的生物多样性，河流里面的生物多样性，以及我们在农作物生产过程中的话，保护生物多样性，这个是他们农业部门的。作为我们生态环境部的话呢，我们的环境科学研究院，他也会去研究生物多样性，他研究不同的污染物。对这些生物多样性的话，会带来什么样的危害？所以部门也有，呃，专门的研究机构研究生物多样性。第四类的话呢，就是我们的地方，比如说我们是属于中央级，下面的话呢还有省级，呃，甚至市这一级，那么它也有相应的研究机构啊，呃，和生物多样性有关的。我给大家举一个例子，比如说，呃，四川也在中国的西南部，那么主要是研这个大熊猫的故乡。那么四川的话呢，中国研究大熊猫比较有名的机构，呃，因为四川的话，它研究这方面工作比较早。另外，四川也是中国大熊猫的故乡，所以说它近水楼台先得月，所以它的研究实力是比较强的。如果大家有机会啊，到中国来，到四川走一走，可以看到大熊猫的故乡，可以看到很多研究机构、很多科学家在从事这方面的研究。所以说，我想。呃呃，回过头来，刚才我前面说的，回答这个问题的话呢，说简单它也简单，说复杂的话呢，刚才我已经说了四个方面，我还不一定把它说完了。呃，总之的话呢，我认为呢，在中国生物多样性的研究啊，呃，是呃非常呃广的、非常多的、非常呃宽的这么一个一个领域，科学家在做这方面的工作。呃，欢迎大家到呃中国来。和我们的科学家一起开展这方面的交流和合作，谢谢。Thank you very much, Minister Huang, and、um, indeed, yes, you've outlined a, a wide range of institutions, and、uh, I think、uh, the global community can gain a lot from. The the work of Chinese institutions and the the evidence base that it has developed will be very important as we move forward in implementing and monitoring the post 2020 global biodiversity framework.、Um, so I now we have a few more minutes. I turn briefly、um, to again、uh, Deputy Secretary Agueta Villamar.、Um, uh, If he has any remarks on、um, ge genetic diversity, and then we'll move to the next block of、um, speakers. Thank you. Sí, muchas gracias.、Um, en relación a la conservación del del maíz,、eh, que como ustedes bien saben, México es el centro de origen y domesticación del maíz en el mundo. Eh, el día 31 de diciembre del año pasado, el presidente de México emitió un decreto、eh, para、eh, prohibir la importación de maíz transgénico a nuestro país. Al mismo tiempo, una reducción paulatina de la importación de glifosato que、eh, justamente es un herbicida que eh, está eh, destruyendo buena parte de la、eh, de las plantas que acompañan a la milpa、eh, de maíz en México también eso es eso es algo fundamental en este momento nos encontramos en ese proceso y、eh, quiero decir que ha sido muy bien recibido por Eh, organizaciones eh, campesinas,、eh, por ejemplo el programa Sin Maíz No Hay País y una gran cantidad de organizaciones que se dedican a cultivar milpa en nuestro país, milpa ligada a los centros、eh, de culturas、eh, indígenas, campesinas a lo largo y ancho del país. Eh, México tiene 59 razas de maíz y más de 300 variedades de raza. Esa es un legado biocultural fundamental que estamos obligados a mantener. 
eh, es para las nuevas generaciones, es decir, hacerlo un recurso sustentable de la alimentación de nuestro país. Así como el señor Wong habló de los hongos como fundamentales en la alimentación en Hunan, el maíz es la base de la alimentación del pueblo de México y de buena parte de Centroamérica. Así también tenemos otros programas, como ya decía, el programa GISAMAC, que es el Grupo Intersecretarial de Salud Alimentaria, Medio Ambiente y Competitividad. Este programa justamente se dedica a crear un sistema agroalimentario justo, saludable, sustentable y competitivo. Eh, su, su lema es producción sana de alimentos sanos. Y en eso estamos comprometidos, como ya señalaba, seis instituciones del gobierno federal, más eh, gobiernos estatales eh, o subnacionales y municipales. Tenemos varios programas en ese sentido. Eh, uno de ellos, por ejemplo, que es muy importante en esta, señalarlo en esta ocasión, es el trabajo que se está haciendo para conservar eh, el, el cultivo e impulsar el cultivo de maíces nativos en las áreas naturales protegidas, en las zonas buffer, en las zonas eh, periféricas a las áreas naturales protegidas, donde tenemos una gran cantidad de esas variedades de maíces eh, eh, cultivándose por parte de eh, campesinos eh, y um, habitantes de esas zonas. Eh, son reservorios importantísimos. Ahí está clara la relación entre producción alimentaria y conservación de la biodiversidad en nuestro país. Eh, son 182 áreas naturales protegidas de carácter federal y en esas eh, se están desarrollando por lo menos dos, dos, dos grandes programas. El programa de conservación para el desarrollo sostenible y el programa de, eh, de escuelas agroecológicas para la sustentabilidad, donde estamos desarrollando, eh, y, eh, desarrollando eh, programas para sistemas agroecológicos tradicionales altamente resilientes. Eh, hay otros eh, programas más eh, de fortalecimiento de la cultura eh, de la MILPA eh, por parte de la Secretaría de Agricultura y eh, también hay un programa muy importante de eh, agrobiodiversidad nativa por parte de la CONAVIO, eh, donde trabaja el señor Ezequiel Benítez que usted señaló, David, hace un rato. En fin, hay una, bueno, y Habría que mencionar, dada la pregunta que hicieron al, al, al ministro Wang, eh, muchas universidades eh, nacionales y estatales desarrollan también programas eh, de estudio, análisis de, las, eh, de la diversidad eh, eh, maicera en nuestro país. Existen instituciones también muy importantes como el INIFAP, o eh, el Instituto Nacional de, de Ciencias eh, dedicadas a los temas eh, de agricultura eh, y también, eh, por ejemplo, el Colegio de Postgraduados, el Colpos, que también dedica buena parte de los esfuerzos a ello. En fin, eh, hay una enorme diversidad, pero desde, la, desde el gobierno federal yo diría que estos son los programas que se están llevando a cabo hasta la fecha. Muchas gracias, uh, señor Aguerta Velamar. And uh, I'd like to thank you and uh, Minister Huang um, for being with us this morning, um, for spending time not only to, to, to make a statement, but to engage in discussion. Uh, it's very much appreciated. We've heard a lot about the very strong efforts made in China and in Mexico to 
protect biodiversity, to use biodiversity, to integrate it into agriculture, and also, of course, to um, all the support to the convention um, from COP13 through COP14, and we look forward now to COP15. Um, so with that, we've come to the end of this first segment. Um, and um, we're, unfortunately, we're, we're out of time. So I, I'm now going to thank you both very, very much again. And I'm going to hand over to my co-facilitator, uh, Eduardo Mansour, Director for Climate and, and Biodiversity uh, in uh, FAO. Uh, thank you very much, David. Again. Thank Your you very much, Eduardo. You have the floor. Thank you, David. Your Excellencies, thank you for opening up the dialogue in a constructive and a informative way. We are very honored to have representatives here of two um, uh, commissions. Uh, we have a representative from the European Commission and a representative from the Africa uh, Union Commission. Uh, it's my honor to invite His Excellency, uh, Mr. Janos um, Wojciechowicz, uh, to intervene in the dialogue and bring his words from the European Commission. Your Excellency, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for invitation, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to address all of you at this very important panel. Uh, biodiversity loss, land and sea degradation have accelerated over the last number of decades. Uh, this has brought worsening impact on our economies, societies, and daily lives, as well as our capacity to address global challenges like climate change. Uh, last year, the European Commission adopted uh, its communication on uh, European Union biodiversity, biodiversity strategy for 2030. Bringing nature back into our lives will benefit our people and ecosystems, our planet and climate, uh, and our economy and society as a whole. It will put us in line with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and with the objectives of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Uh, the strategy is ambitious, uh, uh, yet achievable. It proposes a wide-ranging set of commitments and actions to ensure that Europe's biodiversity will be on the path to recovery by 2030. The strategy sets out the European Union's key priorities for the ongoing international negotiations with a view to reaching an ambitious global biodiversity framework as 90% global biodiversity loss is outside of Europe, the strategy supports global action in the context of our bilateral, regional, and multilateral international relations. The loss of biodiversity presents a threat to long-term food production and the agri-food sector, which are highly dependent on biodiversity and natural resources. It threatens the resilience of both managed ecosystems, such as agriculture, forests and aquaculture, as well as food <clears throat> sourced from natural ecosystems, such as uh, fisheries. Uh, urgent action is needed to address the main drivers of biodiversity loss in the context of food production, including the promotion and safeguarding of agrobiodiversity. At the same time, our food systems also have an uh, impact on climate change and environmental degradation. This is why the new uh, European Union biodiversity strategy was adopted together with the so-called farm to fork strategy, which seeks to secure a fair, healthy and environmental friendly food system. It aims to ensure the long-term safety, sustainability and security of the food system in the European, European Union by transforming the way we produce, process, transport, market and consume food products. In this context, the European Union's common agriculture policy uh, is and will continue to be the key tool to support farmers in the transition and in achieving the two fork strategy. 
I'm happy to announce that we have reached agreement on the new common agricultural policy where measure in measures in favor of climate, environment and biodiversity will feature more prominently. We must transform our production methods in order to reduce the use of more hazardous chemical pesticides and fertilizers. Agroecology and other biodiversity friendly production systems such as organic farming. Uh, we uh, must uh, make the best use of nature-based technological and digital solution while ensuring a fair economic return, return for farmers. We are convinced that organic farming has a major role to play worldwide in the transition. We will seek the support of others, such as the FAO and the Convention on Biological Diversity for this transformation, uh, including further development of organic farming worldwide. As the key guardians of our land, farmers play a vital role in preserving the EU's biodiversity. This is why uh, it is important to work with farmers to support their transition to fully environmental friendly practices while ensuring that they continue to thrive. The biodiversity and the farm to fork st uh, strategy will strengthen agro ecosystems, facilitate biological pest control and climate adaptation, which will cut down uh, on production costs and uh, move towards greater sustainability. All in all, it is possible to combine profitably, uh, profitability and sustainability. Given the international nature of food systems, these measures will stimulate a change to food production system, not only inside the EU, but also at an international level. The European Union is committed to increasing its support to partner countries to protect, restore and sustain, uh, sustainably use their biodiversity and ecosystems. The EU will take an integrated approach in line with the target of 10% of funding for biodiversity by 2026, as stated in the new multiannual financial framework. Mainstreaming action across sectors will be also key. In particular, we will step up our support for research and innovation in uh, connection to agroecology. We will also continue to support agrobiodiversity through landscape approaches, as well as the implementation of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. We look forward um, to playing an active role with the FAO and uh, other UN agencies and programs uh, on agrobiodiversity in the UN Food System Summit. We also look forward to connecting the Food System Summit with the Convention on Biological Diversity and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wojciechowski. It's uh, adding fantastically to the, the, the information that uh, you gave us regarding the 10% funding for biodiversity by 2026 from the European Union. Uh, the linking of the, the biodiversity strategy with the, the farm to fork strategy of the EU, connecting biodiversity with climate change. This adds very well with the first part of the dialogue where Minister Huang informed us about the COP15 uh, COP in China and the advances on the um, uh, ecological stabilization and and Deputy Minister Argueta informed us on the progress in, in, in Mexico. So I would like to come back to you before moving to, to, to Africa Union Commissioner. I will advance the questions because while we discuss Africa Union Commission, I would love you to come back to us with just a few points on a, a, a bit more detail in the priorities that uh, I think the, the European Union can bring to us to the information of dialogue in certain areas that may be weaker in other regions, particularly uh, Mr. Wojciechowski, I would like to hear from you on partnership, public-private partnerships, the engagement of private sector and the challenge that we may have 
uh, uh, on this particular aspect of mainstreaming biodiversity. FAO has recently adopted a new strategy on involvement of private private sector, and uh, we would like to have more private sector involvement in biodiversity in all its aspects, in genetic resources, in the species, and also on the ecosystems. Uh, while another aspect that's very important for us is the, the financial mechanisms that would help bring mainstreaming biodiversity to reality. I think it's more or less connected with the point of uh, partnerships with the public and private sector. So while, while you think on this uh, a little bit and I'll come back to you, I would like to invite, unfortunately, the commissioner from the European EU, from the African Union, Madame uh, Josefa Sacco, informed us that she's not feeling well today. We wish uh, Madame Sacco all the best and a prompt recovery. She was very kind to designate Monsieur Simplice Ndwala. Uh, am I correct with the name? Uh, Monsieur Simplice is connected with us. He's the director of uh, the, the Division of uh, Agriculture and Food Security of the African Union. So we would like to hear from you, sir, uh, regarding the advances of the African Union Commission on mainstreaming biodiversity. Monsieur Simplice. Thank you very much. Uh, Vous avez la parole, Monsieur. Thank you very much, facilitator. Uh, DG FAO, uh, Your Excellency, I stand on the existing protocol. I, I wish to convey to you the apologies and the greetings from the Commissioner Sako, Commissioner for, Rural, for Agriculture, Rural Development, Sustainable Environment and Economy of the African Union Commission. And she has requested me to convey the following message to this dialogue. I hope I will be able to do it with the same uh, tone that she would have loved to do so. Your Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, there is a growing recognition that safeguarding biodiversity and managing natural resources sustainably must be a priority if we are to deliver nutritious food for the present and future generation and achieve both the Agenda 2063 goals and the SDG 2030 goals. Today, some of 821 million people still suffer from chronic hunger. Nearly a quarter of children under the age of five are stunned and malnutrition affects a third of the global population. A major response to malnutrition, climate change, emerging diseases, pressures on, on feed and water supply, and shifting market demand is to conserve and sustainably use a wide range of plant and animal diversity. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, why Africa is home to a rich and diverse animal, plant, and marine biodiversity that provide critical ecosystem services, driving the continent economy and serving as buffer to climate change. The continent is experiencing a dramatic loss of biodiversity. The World Bank and FAO estimated that by 2000, Climate change alone could cause a loss of over half of African birth and mammal species, as well as trigger a 20% to 30% decline in lake productivity and a significant loss of plant species. Even more immediate are the ongoing threats to African biodiversity from natural habitat loss to degradation especially from agricultural expansion, overexploitation of wildlife and fishery species, including from illegal hunting and trade and the spray of invasive species. The African Union has remained committed to protecting biodiversity and ecosystem from further destruction and degradation through a number of interventions. This includes sustainable land and ocean management, food production and sustainable forestry management through domestication 
and implementation of the rail convention related to biodiversity, as well as other continental and regional policies. The Great, great Green Wall, an ambitious attempt which was launched in 2007 to cultivate an 8,000 kilometer long, 15 kilometer wide barrier across the Sahel by planting trees, grasslands, and other vegetation. The African Union has developed an African strategy for combating illegal exploitation and trade in wild species. The African Union is also supporting and facilitating the efforts by the member states through supporting the African Group of Negotiation to secure a post-2020 global biodiversity framework that aim to halt and start to reverse biodiversity loss by 2030. The African Union has developed an African Union Green Recovery Action Plan to address biodiversity and nature as one of its five strategic pillars. We we'll therefore look forward to, look, to work with relevant stakeholders and partners in advancing Africa biodiversity agenda in the lead up to the adoption of the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. I thank you for your attention. Merci beaucoup, uh, Monsieur Noala. a été an excellent and brief uh, explanation. But I would like also, before coming back to, to Commissioner Wojciechowski, I'd like to put a question for you to think because uh, we, we know how important, and you highlighted in your presentation, how important the partnerships are for implementing uh, the development activities in Africa. I would like you to think a little bit more and bring to us our expectations, the challenge, the, the, the advantage, the opportunities that uh, we would have in Africa for more partnerships and especially, Ms. Enuala, uh, regarding inclusion. Uh, to bring the different groups and at the different level. Our FAO is putting a high importance now on the SDG 10 amongst the other uh, SDG for equity. Uh, and uh, if you could bring to us from the perspective of mainstreaming, of, of, of integrating biodiversity activities of the African Union, uh, how you think in terms of partnerships and inclusion that could be advanced. Don't respond yet because I'd like to go back to Commissioner Wojciechowski on my questions regarding private sector and financial mechanism, if you could bring us some ideas or insight. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much for your, your question. It's, uh, uh, maybe it's uh, an uh, inter interesting question and uh, it's uh, in my uh, area of my res direct responsibility, agriculture, we have mainly private sector and this is the, the farmers are the, the majority of farms, they are private family farms and there is a, generally the common agricultural policy with uh, all instrument is uh, dedicated to the, to the private sector in the agriculture. But uh, generally for the, for, the, for the biodiversity, about the financing uh, uh, and resource mobilization, the business and finance sector are essential. The European Union uh, is at the forefront of uh, global efforts to green financial flows, notably through the taxonomy of sustainable investment and the upcoming corporate uh, sustainability uh, reporting directive. Uh, as regards the uh, new financing uh, instruments, uh, the European Union has consi consistently defended the development of uh, innovative uh, financial instruments in order to unlock private funding. InvestEU is our new financial instrument uh, that is uh, to trigger significant investments also in natural capital uh, for food and agriculture. Uh, European Union is not in favor of developing new international public financing instruments. We are aware of the calls for setting up a new biodiversity fund, which uh, pre-assembly uh, should also help investing uh, in biodiversity for food and agriculture and mainstreaming biodiversity across sectors. However, the Global Environmental Fund and other existing funds can already foster such investments. And we are 
re, relecutant to create new instru instruments with the corresponding red tape and administrative burden. Uh, resource mobilization will be a make it or break it top 2020 uh, global biodiversity framework and financing for biodiversity for food uh, and agriculture and mainstreaming biodiversity ac uh, across sectors must be part of it. Uh, meeting the huge financing needs for biodiversity can and by aligning all public and private financial flows with biodiversity objectives. Uh, for example, eliminating harmful investments and uh, subsidies and scaling up green investments, uh, including in agriculture, fisheries and food uh, sectors. At the same time, we know that an increase of international financing to developing countries for biodiversity will be an important element in the package to be agreed at uh, CBD COP15 countries. Uh, we are not starting uh, from scratch. The European Union is, and its member states are already well on track to meet their commitment to double biodiversity funding to developing countries by 2015 and maintain that uh, level until 2020 as agreed in uh, Hyderabad at uh, COP11 uh, and uh, in 20, uh, 2012. The European Union is committed to further increase its support to partner countries post-2020, including to support sustainable agriculture, organic farming, agroecology, foster biodiversity financing and investment benefiting nature and help build capacity globally. Thank you. I hope, uh, Your Excellency, that the audience enjoyed as much as I did your information regarding the financial mechanisms, the innovative way that uh, uh, the European uh, Com Commission and the European Union is putting together and, and the consistency of your, commi or your commitment since Hyderabad and towards uh, Kunming. Uh, we thank you very much for that and uh, we congratulate the Commission for its commitment on biodiversity and its link with the Farm to Fork. Uh, let me go back to Messi Anuala with the question in terms of partnerships. How Africa Union uh, could bring to us its, uh, its knowledge, its experience or its, uh, its ambitions in terms of increasing partnership for mainstreaming biodiversity in such an important area that is the food and agriculture uh, sectors, the agri-food systems. Ms. Anuala, I hope I, I'm not embarrassing you and I know that uh, you, you adverted us that you cannot put your camera. We are, we are absolutely sure about that. There is a, a glitch there, but if you could respond to this quick question for us, it would be much appreciated. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, facilitator. I choose not to put my camera because if I do it, then I will have uh, internet challenges. I will have serious problems of connection. Now, uh, putting me on the spot on what the African Union is doing or is, uh, is advocating in terms of partnership to advance uh, biodiversity conservation in its agricultural uh, transformation agenda. I think what we are really advocating, and I think this was said by a previous speaker, uh, when I think from Mexico, when we thought of structural changes, I think we need to build a partnership that brings a new narrative on agricultural transformation on the continent that put biodiversity at the center. I, I think when you look at the, 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 the issues that affect or biodiversity loss on the continent, agriculture is somehow at the center of gravity. And if we start thinking agricultural transformation without thinking biodiversity conservation, then there is a problem. We are of the opinion that mainstreaming the understanding of mainstreaming is not the same with all the partners. Some, when they think of mainstreaming, is an, a second thought, an afterthought. We should not think of mainstreaming biodiversity as an afterthought in agricultural transformation, but we should think of biodiversity when we are planning agricultural transformation on the continent. So the type of partnership that we want to build and that we are advocating is this partnership 
that advance biodiversity conservation as part of the thinking of agricultural transformation on the continent. And this goes from the national level to the regional and the continental level. At national level, we really look at the partnership that brings this structural change. We can, we need to create, and this speaks to the inclusion, we need to create a, a cadre where the Ministry of Agriculture, because that is where agricultural policy has been discussed. When planning agriculture, things of the Ministry of Environment where biodiversity conservation sits. And a speaker said before me, maybe these two need to sit together within the same ministry. Maybe these two need to sit together. But if they cannot because of, pol of some political or policy issues, how can we create a partnership so that there is inclusion in the planning? So this is the type of partnership and inclusion that we are trying within the department to advocate and to push for as an example of partnership that would certainly put biodiversity at the center of the discussion on agricultural transformation in Africa. Thank you so much, Ms. Enuala. I think uh, you made all the point when you said that uh, uh, the understanding of mainstreaming is different. And that's one of the reasons why I particularly, because English is not my mother tongue, prefer to use the, the, the French or the Spanish translation as uh, integration, la integration de la biodiversité, or la integration de la biodiversidad in the different sectors. It is easier for me to understand. But you made the point, and uh, we'd like to convene our best wishes for the prompt recovery of Madame Sacco, the Commissioner of Agriculture of the African Union. And uh, with these uh, uh, inputs, I am very happy to hand over uh, the facilitation to my colleague David Cooper from the CBD uh, for the next session, which deals with the dialogue with the heads of agencies. David, you have the floor and the facilitation. Thank you very much, uh, Eduardo. And yes, yeah, certainly it was very inspiring to get those uh, uh, remarks from the from the commissioners in uh, of the EU and uh, the AU. And um, now um, we will look at the role of uh, international uh, and regional organizations. Uh, of course, the post-2020 global biodiversity framework is indeed intended to be a framework for all, to, to galvanize action across the whole of society. And so we shouldn't see it just as a CBD framework, but as a framework for the entire UN system, indeed for the entire international system. We've heard already how important uh, FAO, the various commissions and, and, uh, and committees under FAO, the various conventions like the International Plant Protection Convention, the Fish Stocks Agreement and others under FAO, how important these will be uh, in promoting and supporting uh, implementation of the post-2020 framework of mainstreaming, or as Eduardo would prefer, integrating biodiversity into the agricultural sectors. Now we'll look at the role of international and regional organizations beyond FAO, and we're very fortunate to have uh, a panel um, now uh, with uh, Joyce Basuya, the Assistant uh, Secretary General of the United Nations and, and Deputy Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Programme. Uh, Mr. Martin Van Newkoop from the World Bank, where he's Global Director for Agriculture and Food. Uh, Mr. Domingos Gove, the Director for Food, Agriculture and Natural Resources from a regional organization, the Southern African Development Community. And uh, Jotsna or Joe Puri, the Director of Environment, Climate, Gender and Social Inclusion at IFAD. Um, if there's time, um, I hope there will be time afterwards to have some brief uh, questions and answers um, uh, as well. Um, it's my real pleasure now to invite uh, Joyce Masuya, Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and Deputy Executive Director at UNEP, to tell us more about the role of UNEP and the wider UN in integrating uh, biodiversity 
across society and across the economy. Uh, Joyce, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, excellencies, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me first start uh, by thanking the organizers uh, for this webinar, uh, FAO as well as the CBD. Uh, it is a real pleasure to join you today in this global dialogue on the role of food and agriculture in the post-2020 global biodiversity uh, framework. Uh, what I would like to focus on in my initial remarks is actually to look at the UN common approach um, uh, with regards to this particular uh, topic. Uh, UN entities, uh, including us, UNEP, um, we recognize that the challenges related to our food system uh, in the context of medium term change uh, is quite clear. The science has spoken and um, it's very clear where the challenges uh, lie. But let me highlight a couple of points that I trust most of the participants are quite aware. Food systems are associated with many of the direct drivers of biodiversity loss through land use change, large scale monoculture of a handful of major food crops at the expense of large numbers of underutilized crops over exploitation of fisheries and impacts of excess nutrients, use of chemicals, food waste and loss, as well as the generation of greenhouse gases. But we also know the social and economic disruption, uh, for example, recently caused by the pandemic has affected the food system, starting from the supply chain, but throughout uh, uh, the system as a whole. Um, the pandemic has highlighted, for example, 3 billion people uh, directly dependent on agriculture, forests and fisheries for food, jobs and livelihoods. Uh, we also know that diversity in production systems is important to resilience, for health, for nutrition and for the associated bi biodiversity, providing the ecosystem services that support agriculture production are sustainable. And therefore, there is an urgent need to mainstream biodiversity across food policies and practices at all levels and to develop long term strategies addressing the sustainability challenges faced by actors across the systems. Previous speakers before me uh, touched upon the collective action that is required from different partners, from private sector, public sector, academicians, et cetera. Sustainable and secure food systems are ensured through agent action by all actors, not just one versus the other. So within the UN system, we believe that by working together as part of the larger system, entities of the UN system to support member states, civil society, as well as the private sector, the UN system can leverage its enormous resources to address the incredibly complex and interconnected dimensions of our food systems. And we have committed, uh, including at the highest level of the United Nations, to join forces along uh, the following areas. First, on global advocacy and normative frameworks, for example, through our communication campaigns to mobilize demand for global action for a unified nature. Uh, second example is through initiatives like the Secretary General's Common Agenda. The UN system convenes dialogues on systemic challenges that can only be addressed through multilateralism. Um, second example is around regional collaboration. The UN regional mechanisms foster collaboration within and between regions to address biodiversity related challenges that transcend geographical borders. Uh, but also regional development banks 
are engaged to integrate biodiversity conservation and nature-based solutions in economic models and design incentives to inform policies for investments in socio-ecological sustainability. Third is at the national level, the national implementation, where with thanks to the recent UN reform, for example, the UN country teams as a system facilitate inclusive multi-stakeholder partnerships and promote networking to resolve development conflicts, nexus issues and landscape seascape level challenges. Uh, the UN resident coordinators and country teams support member states to implement multilateral environmental agreements decisions through the UN sustainable development cooperation frameworks and the COVID-19 socioeconomic responses. So in conclusion, we are now in the moment in history to reflect on cooperation and the choices we need to make to tackle the systemic risks and challenges in our food and agriculture systems and how our societies can be reshaped as part of the sustainable and resilient recovery from the pandemic. And equally important is through the common approach to biodiversity uh, the UN system uh, believes uh, that we can spur a whole of system approach with a focus on national level implementation, but also articulating the socio-economic transitions that the system will require to contribute to a vision of not just living, but thriving in harmony with nature. Thank you very much, David. Thank you very much, Joyce, um, for outlining the, the UN common approach to biodiversity. Um, this common approach will be essential if we are to uh, achieve the goals and targets of the new, of the new framework. I think we uh, very much uh, appreciate the role of all the agencies involved in developing this common approach. And of course, in particular, the Secretary General in his office and to UNEP, uh, uh, for the role in marshalling uh, the development of this, this new common approach, which will, as I say, be, I think, instrumental. Uh, and thanks also for highlighting the, the importance of a broad approach, a whole, of, whole systems approach to get the transformational changes we need, the social and economic changes we need. Um, and that, I think, need, leads us nicely into the next um, speaker from um, the, the World Bank, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Martin van Nieuwkoop, uh, who is Global Director for Agriculture and Food at, at the World Bank. Um, we are seeing an increasing role of the bank in uh, integrating biodiversity in its work and we look forward now to, to hearing more um, from, uh, from Martin. Um, uh, you, ha you have the floor, sir. Very good. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, greetings from uh, Washington, uh, DC. I'm very pleased to be part of this uh, panel uh, uh, today. Uh, when I was appointed as uh, Global Director for Agriculture, actually, I actually changed the name of the Global Practice to Agriculture and Food Global Practice I mean, to reflect actually the, uh, the food systems approach, I mean, that we are putting in place uh, as we speak. Um, let me start. And of course, I mean, everybody knows that, um, you know, agriculture is the biggest driver of biodiversity loss in the world. Um, at the same time, I think that's important. You know, it's one of the many hidden costs of the global food system as we know it. Uh, you know, 2 billion people are undernourished or malnourished. I mean, 2 billion people are overweight or obese. Uh, agriculture and land use chains account for 25% more or less of global greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, one third of agricultural production is lost or wasted. Agriculture uses 70% of the world's fresh water resources, et cetera, et cetera. So if an economic price tag is put in all those hidden costs, you know, it in fact, I mean, surpasses, I mean, the market value of the food system. I mean, this is estimated about, I mean, the market value is estimated about $10 trillion per year. 
So this brings me to the fourth point, I mean, that I would like to emphasize. I mean, the biodiversity problem that we see and be discussing today, and it's part of a larger picture of a global food system that is not fit for purpose. Um, then looking forward, I mean, the global food system that's already not fit for purpose, I mean, needs to feed 2 billion more people by 2050. And projections indicate, I mean, that with business as usual, this will lead to 600 million more hectares of forest to be converted into land for agriculture. And of course, we know what that means, I mean, for biodiversity. I mean, definitely not good news. And this brings me to the second point I would like to emphasize, that is business as usual moving forward is not acceptable. In a way, it is shocking to note, I mean, that public support to a global food system that is not fit for purpose amounts to a whopping $568 billion per year in public support. Most of this public support is provided for market price support, I mean, about 37%, input subsidies, about 15%, output subsidies, about 13%. And of course, we know that this type of support, I mean, causes many technical and allocative inefficiencies, as well as negative environmental externalities. Only 24% of all public support to agriculture and food is geared towards public goods and services. Um, uh, reflecting public goods. I mean, think about agricultural res uh, research extension, or they are provided as green subsidies. In fact, out of the $568 billion total envelope of public support to agriculture and food, only 5% is provided as green subsidies in support of generating positive environmental outcomes. And this brings me to the third point that I would like to emphasize, and that is that existing public support to agriculture and food is contributing to the hidden cost of the global food system, including to the biodiversity problem that we are discussing today. And accordingly, you know, there's a major incentive gap. Um, of course, agriculture is a private sector activity. This was also mentioned by previous speakers in the discussion. Um, in this respect, it is interesting to know that recently a Wall Street Journal survey evaluated 5,500 publicly traded companies on environmental, social, and governance, you know, ESG metrics, so to say. Um, the food industry was very much a no-show uh, in this ranking, with just one food company in the top 100 sustainability ranking, despite the fact that agriculture and food, including retail, is about 12% of global GDP. You would expect 12 of those companies in the top 100 rather than one. And this brings me to my fourth point. Um, the private sector clearly is not leaning in when it comes to improving the sustainability of the global food system. So what needs to be done? Um, in our view at the bank, I mean, there's an important role for governments, I mean, to repurpose existing public support to agriculture and food for better environmental and nutritional outcomes, including biodiversity, of course. If the share of green subsidies would increase from the current 5% to 25%, this would mean an increase from the current $28 billion per year globally to $142 billion per year, which would surpass, I mean, the $100 billion per year in new climate financing that was agreed as part of the Paris Agreement. Of course, you know, this will not be easy as current public support to agriculture and food has lost of vested interest. And accordingly, there's a big political econ economy agenda I mean, to be tackled as part of this repurposing agenda and repurposing process. At the same time, I mean, we see movement in the right direction. Um, among other, we think, I mean, caused by the fact that COVID-19 is causing significant fiscal stress. I mean, this is causing ministers of finance, I mean, to take a hard look at the effectiveness of public sector support programs, including for agriculture and food. Accordingly, we increasingly see, we see references to repurposing public support, reoriented agriculture policies for better sustainable outcomes, mentioned in official communiques issued by the G7 recently, by the uh, Global Forum for Food and Agriculture, organized by the um, um, uh, government of G Germany in January, signed off by 70 plus ministers of agriculture. Uh, we have communiques by the African Union recognizing, I mean, the importance of repurposing uh, public support to agriculture, the recent uh, Matera declaration. I mean, this is all good news. I mean, there's this movement in the right direction. And when it comes to the private sector, there's a lot of discussion in the lead up to the UN Food Systems Summit of which the World Bank, I mean, we are an active member 
of the world uh, of the preparation process as a, as a co-convener of the finance work stream. Um, so there's a, there's a there's very much a debate about mandatory ESG reporting. I mean, climate and nature related risk disclosure for agriculture and food companies, as well as moving forward on the notion of deforestation free pension, uh, pension funds, guidance and commitments. I mean, so this is also uh, uh, good news. Um, of course, in the end, I mean, most of the action will need to happen at the country level. Uh, and in view of this, I mean, the World Bank is very actively engaging on the repurposing agenda through upstream country analytics that we think will provide the necessary data and evidence to policymakers to reform existing public support programs to agriculture and food towards providing better incentives to farmers and agribusiness for investing in sustainable production practices and green supply chains. As part of this work, we are also aiming towards a shift in the mindset uh, of what it means to be a farmer in the 21st century. I mean, not only a producer of food, but also a provider of ecosystem services. We think that would import, you know, um, send an important signal. To move this work forward, I mean, the bank is an active member of the Policy Action Coalition for Repurposing Agriculture Support that was established as part of the Just Rural Transition Initiative, I mean, following the UN Climate Action Summit uh, in 2019. And currently, um, as part of the Policy Action Coalition, we are actively engaging on this agenda in, in upstream analytical work, I mean, for repurposing public support for better environmental and nutritional outcomes in Ethiopia, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Uzbekistan, China, Mongolia, Vietnam, Argentina, Morocco, and we are about to start work on this in Colombia, India, Indonesia, Philippines, Tunisia, Angola, Mozambique, and, and, and Mauritius. Um, also, the bank is managing the Food Systems Land Use and Rest Restoration Impact Program, or FOLUR. I mean, with a commitment of uh, over $300 million from the Global Environmental Facility and expected additional co-financing, I mean, FOLU promotes sustainable integrated landscapes and efficient food value chains at scale. Um, and and FOLU uh, is targeting, you know, large production landscapes, I mean, for eight commodities, including beef, cocoa, corn, coffee, palm oil, rice, soy, and wheat. And currently the impact program portfolio has about 27 country level projects around the world, focusing on the sustainability of these eight commodity uh, value chains. So in Brazil, for instance, FOLU supports a 220 million, one, almost 2 million hectare sustainable multiple use landscape project. In Burundi, FOLU provides $52 million uh, for a coffee landscape restoration and resilience project. In China, FOLU is supporting a $165 million project focusing on the transformation of China's food production systems and agroecological landscapes towards sustainability covering 1.5 million hectares. In Ghana, I mean, support is provided for landscape restoration and ecosystem management for sustainable food system project to the tune of $150 million covering 190,000 hectares. And in Mexico, I mean, FOLU finances, we are financing a $177 million project covering 900,000 hectares that aims to connect watershed health I mean, uh, with beef production. And these are just a few examples. Um, so in conclusion, you know, I mean, biodiversity management uh, and in incentivizing biodiversity management in the, in the uh, national agriculture sector programs and in the overall food systems transformation agenda um, should be in, in a very important ingredient. I mean, uh, in putting in place a global food system that supports healthy people, a healthy planet, and a healthy economy. I mean, governments have a critical role to play by repurposing existing policy and public se sector support programs towards generate a better environmental nutritional outcomes and raising sustainability standards for the private sector. I mean, this is a carrot as well as a stick approach. The economic impacts of COVID-19, we think, provide an opportunity to go beyond business as usual when it comes to putting these policies and public sector programs in place. And in our view, I mean, the upcoming, and we're actively working towards that, the upcoming UN Food Systems Summit, I mean, should be a powerful catalyst in making this happen. Um, thank you, and uh, back to you, David. Thanks very much, uh, Martinez, um, for that very comprehensive 
account, you painted a rather sober picture of the current state of the food system, the huge negative externalities and the problem that we have of subsidies, but also indicated a number of efforts underway to move things and to, to change. Um, we will now um, go to uh, Mr. Domingos Gove um, from the Southern African Development Community, who he is the Director for Food, Agriculture and Natural Resources. Um, uh, so please, uh, Mr. Gove, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, facilitator. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to express our appreciation for your invitation to attend and also allowing us to give a presentation of this important topic on how can regional integration support mainstreaming of biodiversity into agriculture sector while also ensuring the poverty alleviation. SADC is an intergovernmental organization of 16 countries from Southern Africa, being one of the building blocks of the African Union, together with other six regional economic communities. Agriculture is the most important social and economic activity in the region, considering our level of development, the existing low levels of food and nutrition security, and the good agroclimatic conditions. It is in this regard that the region adopted the regional agriculture policy, which is our regional comprehensive Africa agriculture development program compact. It is a legal binding instrument to stimulate sustainable agriculture development and food security in the SADC region. Uh, also, uh, this instrument has been uh, followed by the regional agriculture investment plan, which is an instrument to operationalize the regional agriculture policy including the establishment of the Agriculture Development Fund. The Regional Indicative Strategic Development Plan 2020-2030, approved by the heads of states and government in August 2020, places agriculture under pillar one, which is industrial development and market trade. And strategic objective two indicates a transformed agriculture sector that practice sustainable management of environment and its natural resources. So when we look at agriculture, we're also looking to the environment and natural resources. And one of the outputs includes the promotion of conservation of regional animal and plant genetic resources and their use for food and nutrition security. Our SADC region is home to over 350 million people, 61% of whom lives in rural areas and derive their livelihood from agriculture. As a result, the importance of agriculture to social and economic growth, poverty reduction, food and nutrition security remain central to the region's overall developmental agenda. However, as at the end of March 2021, around 51 million people in our region were food insecure due to the impacts of climate change, mainly drought and cyclones, but equally due to the COVID-19 pandemic impacts. And the majority of the SADC member states, 12 out of 16, have stunting rates that are above 20%. This has reaffirmed to the region that agricultural development should be anchored on a firm foundation of the availability of biodiversity in its entirety, spanning from crops, and here we include uh, from plants, and here we include crops, forest and forest products, animal, including livestock, fisheries and aquaculture and wildlife, and microbial diversity. Through regional integration, the SADC region has managed to develop regional strategies in biodiversity conservation, which has full support across the region and in some instances are unique in their own right. We include the SADC Fisheries Program, the Regional Forest Strategy, the Transfrontier Conservation Program, including a Transfrontier Financing Facility, which was established in 2020 to fund the establishment, operationalization, 
and strengthening of transfrontier conservation network in the region. We include the law enforcement and anti-poaching strategy, the regional green growth, growth strategy, the regional aquatic animal strategy to also minimize the aquaculture genetic development to the regional biodiversity. And we also include the draft regional on invasive alien species strategies. We have 18 transfrontier conservation areas, including terrestrial and marine, and some of them are the largest uh, transfrontier conservation areas in the world, like the Kavangu Zambezi, uh, which includes five SADC member states uh, with an area a bit larger than Spain, the second largest Western European country. Um, this collaboration is a success because of the collective commitment being made by the member states to a regional integration agenda fostered by our motto in SADC of moving together towards a common future. The SADC region has also established the SADC Plant Genetic Resource Center in 1989, which includes a gene bank to promote in situ and ex situ conservation of crop genetic material to conserve and improve agriculture and food and nutrition stability in the region. We have just approved the regional animal genetic resources to also conserve livestock genetic material, including the establishment of a SADC animal genetic resource gene bank. Equally, we're finalizing the establishment of a SADC monitoring, controlling, control and surveillance coordinating center to coordinate the regional fight against illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, which not only depletes stocks and other aquatic marine life, but equally the aquatic biodiversity. All these strategies are aimed at centrally conserving the biodiversity of the region and making them readily available for purpose of agriculture production and food and nutrition security within and outside our region. I would like to emphasize to end by the, the importance of multilateralism, multilateralism nowadays, uh, as it was indicated by um, our panel member from UNAN. This is a time that member states should work closely together for the development of their communities. We have long since realized that there is no country that is self-sufficient for biodiversity, even if it's the, the most richest one, and that there is a need for collaborative efforts to supplement each other's to equitably exploit the benefits derived from available biodiversity. International, including through CBD and regional integration and mainstreaming of conservation sustainable use of our biodiversity offers the best model to address systemic food insecurity and alleviation of poverty. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Domingos. Um, thank you. It's very useful to have this perspective from uh, a regional uh, economic integration uh, organization, uh, a region where there's been, a, I think, a lot of innovation uh, in biodiversity management, sustainable use, uh, agriculture, the bioeconomy, um, and thank you also for highlighting the challenges and, of course, also for echoing this call for multilateralism, um, which we clearly need to address the challenges that we have on biodiversity, on climate, and, of course, now facing uh, the ongoing pandemic, uh, where we clearly need more multilateralism. Um, let's move we're a little bit behind time so i'll move now quickly to our final speaker and then we'll have some a time for some discussion i hope um, i'm very pleased to introduce joe puri uh, from ifad um, the international fund for agricultural development one of the other rome-based uh, institutions uh, uh, joe puri is director for environment climate gender and social inclusion uh, we very much look forward to hearing what she has to say. Jo, uh, please go ahead, you, you have the floor. Thank you so much, David. Excellencies, um, David, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, a huge pleasure for me to be here. 
So um, as part of my very brief comments, I'm going to make two big points. Um, one on the salience of um, examining the intersections between small scale agriculture and biodiversity. And second on the needs for integrating this and then um, and how IFAD is rising up to the challenge. So on the first one, um, Small scale agriculture, as we know, is a crucial sector for um, holistic biodiversity, climate and social action. However, we find that despite the importance of the sector in global food systems, um, as well as the importance of the sector with respect to ensure reducing vulnerability to humanitarian and environmental crisis, the sector remains woefully underserved. In uh, some work that we have done last year, we found that 1.7% of overall climate flows actually went to small scale producers in rural areas. This is very important because farmers as well as small scale producers remain one of the most important custodians of biodiversity, especially as it is located at the intersection of food systems and, um, and agricultural systems. Uh, the beleaguered state of the world's biodiversity is of critical concern to IFAD, with one million plant and animal species facing extinction currently. The ecosystem function and services that biodiversity supports hangs in balance. Um, this has come out really strongly by a whole host of reports that came out earlier this year. Um, but despite this, at the end of 2020, the world had failed to fully meet a single um, target on the Aichi biodiversity targets. Last month, so in June of, uh, June of this year, a joint IBPAS IPCC report found that previous policies have largely tackled biodiversity loss on one side and climate change really decoupled from each other in, or independently from each other. And so it's really important that we start to address the synergies between mitigating biodiversity loss and climate change um, at the same time. Uh, so while considering their social impact, uh, because this offers us the opportunity to maximize benefits and meet global development goals together while recognizing um, the enormous synergies that we have in this space. Um, we are also recognizing that global food systems currently re rely on a dangerously narrow range of species and genetic diversity. 90% of our calories, ladies and gentlemen, come from 103 species. So approximately 100 species, right? 90% of our calories. So within that, it's rice, potatoes, wheat, and maize that account for 60% alone, despite the fact that there are 7,000 plant species that have been cultivated for food throughout history. This is precisely why targeting small scale producers is really, really critical for leveraging the synergies that we see between, um, um, between biodiversity loss on one side, food systems in, on the other, and also climate change adaptation and mitigation on the same side. Because this will, we feel that this is really critical for ensuring the kind of transformation that we want to see in alleviating poverty and food insecurity. Um, Rural smallholder farmers are at the interface of um, multiple crises, and these include environmental and social crises, but um, also um, economic crises. And so integrating all of these sectors can really help us leverage a key opportunity to address these issues holistically. Um, as Martin has also commented, um, we recognize as well that agriculture perversely is very prominent as one of the key drivers of biodiversity loss, primarily through expansion and intensification. And that's where policy becomes really important because in almost all of our investments, we also recognize that both the substitution and the income effects. So, you know, for economists, these things become really important. We try and address some of these consequences and these trade-offs through addressing the question of what are the substitution effects and what are the income effects or the scale effects of our investments. And really then targeting um, areas that we can mitigate some of the losses that are bound to be there. Degradation of services that we derive from biodiversity has had catastrophic repercussions. In 2008, 
the European Commission estimated that by 2050, the cost of inaction and biodiversity loss could result in losses of vital ecosystem services to the uh, tune of 14 trillion euros per year. Most of this caused because of lack of pollination related services, soil nutrient cycling services, climate disease and pest resilience, as well as the absence of climate and water regulation. So given all of this, what is IFA doing? Um, I'm really uh, excited that going forward and in December this year, IFAD will take its first biodiversity strategy to, the exec to its executive board. In doing so, we're recognizing that biodiversity is a really important tool for us um, to target within our own operations in coming years. Uh, by implementing the strategy, we will be equipping our entire program of loan and grants, as well as a larger program of work, which includes as well co-financing, as well as supplementary funds from our partners, to inform progress that is made, as well as to contribute to building the evidence and sharing knowledge and solutions that conserve biodiversity, while at the same time contributing to development goals. Um, with, um, with our biodiversity sensitive agriculture and nature-based solutions that are already being integrated, and thank you for that word. Um, I, I hate using the word mainstreaming. I really like integration. The biodiversity strategy will provide a far more, far greater and systematic guidance to the inclusion of biodiversity activities in all of our investments going, going forward. We recognize, of course, that food systems need to be nourished and reformed. But there are key things that we can do, um, just in terms of what, we, other than, of course, what we are targeting through the biodiversity strategy. Um, I come from the measurement side, and a key thing that also concerns me is that um, we know that we measure what we treasure. Current agricultural metrics, such as yield per hectare or calories produced, exclude important considerations such as biodiversity and nutrition. So what we are looking to do is also to think internally, but I'm going to exhort all of us to think of a more tangible metric that can incorporate dynamic linkages between food systems and other sustainability outcomes, uh, while also helping us improve the state of evidence-based policymaking. A few years ago, a agrobiodiversity index was proposed. And I suggest that this is something that we together all start to examine while including considerations of externalities within those. Um, I'm also going to suggest that instead of just looking at supplementation strategies, food-based strategies using locally available agrobiodiversity, as well as wild or collected food diversity and strategies that promote consumption of a wide range of local foods um, that are distinct um, yeah, will be far more cost effective, but also sustainable on a long-term basis. In this case, EFAS has produced a series of how to do notes on neglected and underutilized species that I'm also going to encourage all of you to take a look at. So we'll need to wrap up fairly soon. Sorry to interrupt. Last comment. Yes, thanks, David. Um, so um, just to wrap that up, uh, we're working on adaptation on landscape approaches with a whole range of agencies, including the GCF with Jeff, um, as well as agroecology initiatives. Um, and then through our biodiversity work, we're recognizing that all of these will contribute to increasing resilience. So my four key takeaways, combine climate and biodiversity, focus on evidence-based work on agroecology and agrobiodiversity, recognize biodiversity and rural producers as a key part of the overall objective, um, and recognize that there's a nexus between biodiversity and food systems because they are the key custodians in this space. Thank you, and back to you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and thank you in particular for highlighting the key role of small scale producers. So as you say, uh, they, they produce most of the, our food, in fact, and um, in particular, most of the nutrients beyond uh, calories. Um, and thanks for the good news also that uh, IFAD is developing its first uh, biodiversity strategy. And I think a lot of the tools and metrics and ideas you've proposed will be 
really useful as we as we move forward. We are a little bit short of time. I'm going to um, just, um, and we have a lot of questions that have come up, but um, I'm going to put these together. Um, there's a lot of questions about uh, aligning finance and how we can support uh, uh, pr production and small scale producers. Um, so I have a, one question uh, and any of the panelists will be free to, to respond to, the, to, to, this, to this question. Um, you've all highlighted the need for, for transformation. You've all highlighted that currently our finance, our public and um, uh, finance is working against um, biodiversity um, in most cases. Uh, so, and we're under invested in small scale producers. So my question is how, when we are moving towards the transformation, the transitions that we need, can we ensure that it's a just transition? In other words, can we, what measures can we take to make sure that finance is realigned, public and private finance is realigned in support of biodiversity and in particular for small scale producers? And how can we maximize jobs um, in uh, this sector that in a way that is still um, supportive of, of sustainability in the long term? Um, these are big questions. You'll only be able to uh, give uh, maybe some, some, some very brief uh, insights in, in the five or 10 minutes that we, that we have left before we have to move to the next um, section of this, of this panel. Um, I don't know, Joe, if you want to go first on, on this and then we'll see if others, any others would like to come in. Thanks, um, David. Yeah, I think I, I think the question is a really important one in terms of just transitions as well, um, just transitions as well, well as equitable transitions. Uh, it becomes really important to recognize that most most policies and investments that we put out have trade offs. And, um, and these are the things that we are exhorting uh, our own stakeholders as well as our country counterparts to examine and to also incorporate into their own strategies. Because finally, IFAD um, is, is essentially positioned to provide the kind of resources and the kind of investments that our country counterparts are really keen to bring in and um, are also, and IFAD is also committed to ensuring that a lot of these strategies are country led and country driven. So our, the key way in which we try and work on these pretty important and ever present trade-offs um, is to really alert um, our counterparts um, and stakeholders on the ground of uh, potential trade-offs and um, as to and of strategies that we can undertake to essentially mitigate these. Uh, one of the other things is to also think about repurposing finance flows as they're coming in, right? So those, um, so for example, our rural protection um, strategic framework is really um, uh, support that we provided to countries by way of for the pandemic and um, really then restructuring and repurposing a lot of the grant um, investment and the grant related investments that we've made to then recognize as to how this can be made far more equitable becomes a really key objective for us. And that's been our advice to countries too. Thanks. Thanks very much. And uh, just, a, we have a, just now a, a very brief response also, I think from Martin. Yes, thanks, uh, David. An excellent question. You know, it, um, when it comes to just rural transition, you know, I mean, there are 500 million smallholder farms in the world. So how can we actually make sure that the transformation of the food system that we're looking for works for them? Uh, and that goes back to what I said in my intervention. You know, we, see, we need to redefine what it means to be a farmer in the 21st century, not just a provider of food, but also a provider of ecosystem services. Um, Farmers, you know, have a central role to play. I mean, when we promote nature-based solutions, uh, you know, generating all kind of services that society uh, appreciates and values. Uh, so we need to avoid that society is a free rider and actually redesign policies and public support programs so that farmers actually are going to be rewarded and compensated for providing those services that society values. And that's the direction that we're taking 
in our investments uh, that we're supporting in our countries uh, to the World Bank. This is also, David, I mean, very much in line with the kind of conversations that we have with producer organizations, uh, in the World Farmers Organization, et cetera. I mean, farmers are very much on board on this agenda uh, to deliver, you know, um, this as part of their new business model, I mean, so to say. Uh, back to you. Thank you very much. And um, I, we will have a, a now, I think, some, some remarks, also some brief remarks from Domingos. Please, please go ahead. Yes, thank, thank, thank you, facilitator. I think uh, uh, from our context, it's, it's very simple. Um, when we speak about agriculture, it's um, a discussion and processes that are being led by governments uh, in our context. And we're really missing the adequate engagement of those that make the difference, uh, namely the smallholder farmers. Um, I think um, it's really critical that they are brought in the table so that we are able to engage them um, in promoting the, the, the agriculture for including maximizing the jobs and so on. And that's why uh, within SADC, uh, we are mainstreaming, for example, the gender, because when we speak about smallholder farmers, the men who speak about women, we are mainstreaming gender in the agriculture uh, work. We have also um, uh, established, or the private sector established SADC business forum, and now we are promoting the mechanisms to engage them because all the SADC process were government-led processes. And now we're realizing that we have to move with the private sector in all the spectrum. So I think it's really critical to bring the relevant partners on board. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And I think um, it's a pity we, we don't have more time. This would be a very rich discussion, but we've had, I think, some excellent points made in, in the presentations uh, and in the, the, the question now. Um, certainly looking from the top down, the need to uh, redirect public and private finance um, and look at what the role, the enabling role of government is to do that. And of course, then just as important, uh, investing in, in the bottom up, uh, making sure that that farmers, fisher folk, indigenous peoples, local communities are involved, making sure that um, women and girls are fully empowered and involved um, if we're going to move to a, a just transformation towards uh, a food system um, that is sustainable and productive uh, and will help us on our road to uh, the 2050 vision that has been established under the Convention on Biological Diversity of, of living in, in harmony with nature. So I'd like to thank very much our four speakers. Um, and um, now I will hand over again back to my friend and co-facilitator, Eduardo. Um, thank Eduardo. you very much, David. Thank you. It has been very inspiring. And uh, I, I will take advantage of the interpretation uh, and I'll, I'll do the next facilitation in Spanish because it's a, it's a great pleasure to arrive at this stage. Nosotros eh, estuvimos trabajando por dos días seguidos en este diálogo, en este seguimiento de alto nivel sobre el papel de la alimentación y de la agricultura en el, en el marco general global de la biodiversidad y eh, del post-2020. Y tuvimos eh, el placer de tener con nosotros la co-facilitación, la co-presidencia de este diálogo eh, dividida entre um, embajadores de, de, de distintos países, de distintas regiones que prepararon su, su informe, eh, su, su informe de la sesión, que nos ayuda en todos los sentidos, nos ayuda a, a nosotros en la CBD, a, a, a los colegas de la CBD, a nosotros en la FAO, a la implementación, al diálogo que sigue para construir de 2020, 2021, eh, este eh, Super Year for Nature. Eh, esta parte no sé decir en español, pero entienden lo que quiero decir. Tenemos un super desafío de la naturaleza y tenemos un momento único eh, de darse la vuelta, incluyendo 
en una, en una respuesta verde a los desafíos que la pandemia, que esta nueva, nueva, nueva realidad nos ha traído. Entonces, eh, para, para resumir eh, y traer la, la impresión de todo este diálogo, de estos dos días de trabajo, los copresidentes de, del diálogo han elegido eh, su excelencia, el señor embajador y representante permanente de, 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 de México, don Miguel Jorge García Binder, que nos presente eh, los resultados, eh, cómo fueron compilados por los co-chairs. Entonces, don Miguel, es, con, es un gran honor de pasar la palabra antes de la sesión de cierre para que usted nos presente las reflexiones, las impresiones del diálogo global y del seguimiento de alto nivel sobre el papel de los sistemas agroalimentarios en, en el marco general global de la biodiversidad. Miguel, usted tiene la palabra. Muchas gracias. Gracias, estimado doctor Melser. Me siento raro cuando me hablan tanto de usted, pero muchas gracias. Este, I just hope uh, my microphone is better than yesterday, uh, especially for the sake of our interpreters to whom I owe them an apology because I was using a Wi-Fi uh, microphone and that seems to um, cause a problem. So I'm, I'm learning little by little on the tricks of this uh, Zoom. Uh, first of all, it's an honor for me to try to summarize the day two uh, of work that we just finalized in today. Uh, as you know, the day one was already presented this morning. Uh, we don't want to repeat, I don't want to take your time and repeat uh, all the things that uh, were said. But one of the interesting parts is that many of the things that were highlighted by my uh, co-chairs, which I am very grateful of for their work and, and their inclusiveness, uh, were supported by the discussion on today. You know, there are some common threads that we hope we can highlight in our final report. Since this is a, a meeting that is a virtual meeting, it has been quite difficult for us uh, co-chairs get together to finalize a document. And obviously a document of this nature with such a rich discussion takes a lot of time to prepare. We will work on this with the FAO help and other institutions help. And uh, hopefully uh, this report will be shared uh, to the CBD and also to some of the internal uh, groups uh, within FAO and other organizations. So they can, they can help in the design of uh, actions or the guidance of actions and policies. Um, I think uh, this morning we, we I would try to make the best of my efforts. Uh, this morning, uh, we continue to uh, to focus on how to, to implement this agenda for the next uh, decade and beyond. Uh, we have two distinguished keynote speakers, the 2021 World Food Prize, Prize winner, Ms. Uh, Shakuntala Haraskiven Tilset, and I apologize, uh, being a Spanish speaker, and a bad English speaker, normally I have problems with uh, pronunciation of, of, of my names, uh, of names. So I offer you to an, uh, an apology. Uh, we also have a participation of the former president of Mauritius. Uh, both spoke about biodiversity in food systems and especially during the food system transition and the critical role that ecosystems restoration and maintenance uh, play. Many of the key, key messages echo and reinforce some of the discussions that we have from the first day. And we were remind that our food systems uh, only utilize a narrow set of species and varieties, both on land and uh, aquatic food systems. Even though yesterday somebody indicated that uh, we need to consider uh, what is happening in the aquatic food system because it looks like we had a larger variety of animals uh, being utilized. There are opportunities through increasing our food diversity to achieve nutritional and, and environmental benefits. Uh, probably one of the most important discussions uh, is uh, the rescuing of forgotten crops. On the economics of biodiversity, uh, it was highlighted that biodiversity is essential for the economic prosperity and well-being. 
the collapse of ecosystem services will impact significantly uh, all the economies and the loss of GDPs in every country. We need to scale up and expand and sustain investments in the conservation and restoration of biodiversity, including in productive landscapes and seascapes. This could contribute one third, uh, contribute, uh, one third of climate change, change mitigation required while also curbing the risk of future pandemics. Some of the solutions that were uh, shared was main streaming natural capital accounting to ensure that investment decisions consider the risk of biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradation, eliminating the perverse subsidies and redirecting those to support biodiversity friendly production. This has been a consistent message throughout the entire global dialogue. Some guiding principles uh, are coming out this first part of the morning uh, to help in the transformation of food systems include identi identify synergies that can be achieved by integrating production systems, including between crops, trees, livestock, and aquatic system, lean traditional knowledge uh, with science and technology, Move, move towards circular production system that reduce the loss of nutrients and obviously the loss of food, increase the efficiency of natural resources and input use, engaging and empowering a range of stakeholders, including youth and women, and working across research disciplines and applying holistic approaches. Uh, the conversation also focused in a more detail on the process to develop the post-2020 uh, global biodiversity framework uh, with a briefing delivered by the co-chairs of the open-end working group to the develop of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. The IQ targets were not met and the lessons learned would, uh, would need to be applied in the post-2020 uh, agenda. For example, for example, the last framework seen as exclusively in the purview of environmental ministries and the new 2020 or post 2020 framework needs to be more inclusive. Therefore, the new framework aims to engage all sectors, including productive sectors and a wide range of actors in the development and implementation of these uh, practices. The other CBD working group will consider refining the monitoring accountability and reporting elements to the framework where FAO will have a strong role. In the words of the co-chairs of the open-ended uh, working group, we will be successfully individually if we were successfully collectively. We have to work together. In the round table of the Bureau members of several FAO technical committees and statutory bodies highlighted the importance that their bodies have given to biodiversity, supporting on the one side, the FAO strategy and its action plan, and also requesting FAO support to the implementation of the post 2020 GFB and collaborating with the CBD. We also heard today that the outcome of the global dialogue will be brought to the attention of the FAO technical committees, including the Committee of Agriculture, which is another activity foreseen in the FAO action plan. We are therefore positive that biodiversity is even more strongly embedded in FAO, and we hope that this role be reflected in the post-2020 GFB. Uh, we also have uh, an opportunity to hear uh, the high panel, the high panel uh, participation of ministers and vice ministers and high level experts. Uh, and, and from this uh, dialogue, I have uh, highlighted some important comments. Uh, first, the, the, the dependence of agriculture on the uh, healthy uh, permanence of biodiversity. The second uh, point that was highlighted in this conversation is that all the actors in agriculture are important. Uh, this uh, in in this uh, involvement, the producers had a vital, a vital role. And we also recently heard that it probably going to be needed that we redefine what a farmer or producer is for the 
Uh, Eduardo, if I if I get too long, uh, no, no. Uh, if you can wrap up, it would be interesting. Okay, I will wrap up uh, the importance of the uh, biocultural biocultural traditions, the importance of collaboration uh, partnerships, and especially we need to work uh, intensively to bring the private sector on board. Uh, these are some of the comments of this year. I'm sorry for taking this long. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mansur. And hopefully, uh, we'll have this in the hands of uh, the Commission as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, uh, sorry, the, the noise we heard was one of the participants had the, the mic open, but uh, our host uh, just managed to repair, uh, to, to, to mute. And I think uh, uh, you did an outstanding uh, a summary. So our words are of thank you very much uh, for yourself, for the ambassadors of uh, South Africa, of uh, UK and Thailand who work together. Uh, I think in perfect harmony uh, as we heard this morning in the, in the cultural moment that the harmony in nature is similar to the harmony in music or in the performance art just one piece that's not there. That small triangle on the orchestra is not there, that things don't go right. In nature is similar. And uh, I think this reflects very nicely when you said the dependence of agriculture on healthy biodiversity, on healthy ecosystems, on healthy genetic resources that uh, are the essence for the increased productivity that is necessary for the supply of the, the food in the diversity on the nutritious aspects that are necessary. We captured very well uh, the, the report. Of course, this is going to be compiled and available at the website. And uh, uh, from my side, in terms of facilitation, uh, my duty ends here. I am happy to return the baton to my colleague uh, from CBD, uh, the Deputy Executive Secretary, uh, Dave Cooper, to conduct the closing session. David, you have the floor and the baton. Thank you very much, uh, Eduardo. Um, and um, let me express my appreciation to the, the co-chairs of this dialogue, to Embajador Garcia Winder for the uh, summary just presented, uh, and to the other co-chairs, Ambassador Sarch, Ambassador Saba, and Ambassador Tiensen for their really hard work uh, over these days, uh, guiding discussions, uh, uh, helping to uh, bring the discussions together and presenting such a good uh, summary uh, yesterday, this morning, and, and just now. Um, I would also like to express my thanks to colleagues in, in FAO uh, and CBD. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to uh, have the honor to, to co-facilitate today's session and especially as a former staff member of, of CBD and the present staff member, uh, a former staff member of FAO and a current staff member of CBD. Um, I'd like to thank everyone behind the scenes also, uh, um, the, the, the interpreters and all those involved in moderating the IT teams and so on. Um, and of course, all speakers, panelists, participants, um, for the very, very rich discussions. As we move forward uh, to develop and eventually adopt in Kunming the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, the continued engagement of the food and agricultural sectors will be crucial. And of course, when we come to implement the framework, even more so. So we're very um, grateful that, that FAO has taken on this challenge to help us do that. Uh, and now have the, the pleasure of uh, inviting uh, the Director General of FAO and the Executive Secretary of the CBD to provide some closing remarks. Uh, I'd like to really express our appreciation to the leadership of, uh, of Dr. Chu Dongyu, the Director General of FAO, uh, and 
Dr. Chu, Director General, uh, you now have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, uh, my colleague uh, and uh, co-chair, facilitator, Mr. Kuba, friend from different countries, and also, of course, FL colleagues, uh, Semedo and Eduardo, and, uh, and uh, Elizabeth, it's my dear uh, sister. You know, the uh, biodiversity, you can see even the uh, uh, meeting, huh? Uh, uh, it's so diversity. <laughs> uh, and you have to get all the corner, every uh, atoms, issues to be heard, to be addressed. That's I think the first one, that's my pressure I want to share with you. Every, every sector, they have a voice on the biodiversity. Yeah, because even we are human beings, yeah? genetically we are, we are equal, we are same. But look at the face are different also. <laughs> and the way of the thinking, the biodiversity and all the science based also different. So that is the global uh, natural. So I thank all of you for your valuable contribution and to this global dialogue over the past two days. I think it's a little challenge, not only COVID-19 pandemic, also challenge of infrastructure, challenge of the uh, time, challenge of the time zone, and challenge of the uh, uh, way of thinking, yeah, or priority one. But I really appreciate all of you, yeah. One sentence, one paragraph, one book, it's, it's a contribution. And step by step, uh, Spanish say boco y boco, uh, and mucho trabajo, and then we end the uh, big mission. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I command you all for staying connected and committed. You can see, uh, I'm my first per now the DG started with uh, opening and closing and, <laughs> and three times. Huh? And Samedo, he 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 only paid me one salary, but used me uh, three times. Huh? You can see how much I engage personally <laughs> with the biodiversity. Yeah. Because I said the biodiversity is the basic for the food diversity. Also, this global di dialogue highlighted the spirit of a close collaboration between FAO and the CBD and the members, more important on the ground. That's my opinion. And uh, ECO, it equals the agent call to mainstream biodiversity across the agricultural sector on the road to the COP15 in Kuomintang, China, and also COP26 and others. So, we really wanted to have a, a global coherent collective action, what I said. I don't want to spend so much time uh, uh, on you to, uh, to say too much a bureaucratic uh, slogan sentence, but I wanted to uh, first my own observation thinking. First, biodiversity, we need addressed science-based, first. Second, legal governance. I think biodiversity is still we, we are missing or lack of the legal governance or effective governance globally because of so many ex extinct animals, crops, plants, no punishment. So but if something, a uh, small thing, so you are 1,000 euro or uh, yuan stolen, and then someone uh, should be punished. <laughs> but why you distinguish one value, invaluable species? No, any accountable uh, person, organizations, or regions to look at even. So I think we need a more uh, effective governance, at least legally, uh, of course, based on science. A third, I think also uh, biodiversity, we have to need more investment. Investment on the research, investment on the education, investment on the uh, public science and get the public awareness. Because people, they saw that mushroom is a mushroom, microorganism, mi microorganism. But once the, one species are disappeared, you can't get it forever. That's, we don't know what is the treasure for the future for the new medicine, for the new food, for the new special functional elements, we don't know. 
So that's why we, we, say we need a more investment uh, uh, on that. Public awareness, research, and education. And another aspect, I think, about diversity, we should also build a more close linkage with the food diversity. Because when you talk about biodiversity, it's the most theoretically scientific topic. But the food diversity is more relevant to the daily life. People, they benefit from their enjoyment, from their uh, development, from their uh, uh, value, and they will start to uh, protect the mushroom, for instance. They wanted to protect the 1,000 species of mushroom because simply they taste the mushroom, so delicious. But you tell them there are 1,000 mushrooms, so delicious. I only read the, your book uh, from uh, Vicho or whatever, <laughs> print a beautiful picture. Oh, it's, it's something, but it's not so uh, astonished to your heart. So I think we need also the, uh, uh, that aspect, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, fear the linkage and not the uh, contradiction. And also we have to learn from indigenous people because there are so many indigenous people that have a knowledge, but they didn't have a, a study the scientific. And also the, we have to learn from different regions, Asia, Latin America, small islands, state Africa, Europe, different region, different uh, country, they have their own best practice. So we can share. That's what we can do FAO, huh? make the uh, uh, more uh, country lead examples, how to establish and protect it and more reliable. And the last aspects I, don't, I want to say, government should play the leading role because that is a global public good. If the, any member government didn't take the leading role in their own country or in their own territory, that's not allowed to. Eh? It's not acceptable. <laughs> and, and then we need to get a more inclusive collaboration with the civil society, academic, and the private sector who are willing to, uh, uh, to support these issues. And of course, international organizations like FAO and other international, we have to work together more closely, more one-to-one uh, uh, -one plus uh, uh, more than two. Uh, that's kind of a value-added cooperation, not too much uh, fighting. I, I, I don't like fighting. I like the cooperation. Uh, and uh, so with that, it's just start. It's a new start, new platform, and a new start point. And then we go to the uh, Kuiming uh, COP15 and uh, beyond COP15. COP15 is only a summit, but it's a mo social movement. So and let's work together, learn it together, and contribute together, and make this uh, planet with sustainable biodiversity and uh, for our generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you, Mr. Kuba. Thank you very much, Director General. Um, yes, you're right, food embodies biodiversity. Uh, thank you um, for your inspiring uh, summary and for your enthusiasm and for staying with us uh, through this, this, uh, this global dialogue and for your ongoing and sustained support to this uh, agenda of integrating biodiversity uh, and food and agriculture for the benefit of all. Uh, as you say, we need more cooperation. So really, thank you very much indeed. And now I have the pleasure to uh, invite uh, my friend and colleague, the, the, the Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity, Elizabeth Maruma Marema for her closing remarks. Elizabeth, you have the floor. Thank you very much, David, and through you also to the FAO co-facilitators. Dr. Chu Dongju, Director of FAO, sincere thanks to you and through you, our colleagues at FAO who have collaborated with us at the CBD Secretariat to get all this discussion in the last two days until now on the uh, connection in separate nature of food, agriculture, and biodiversity. The three cannot be separated. And I think that uh, these two days have clearly demonstrated 
uh, that connection. Not surprising and delighted for your leadership that we are uh, meeting these two days to deep dive into uh, those issues which cut across these three matters. It has been a pleasure indeed to hear all the insightful views and recommendations, including your own, Mr. Chu, on how to mainstream biodiversity in our food systems over the course of the last two days. By bringing together all the actors of our food system, we have created an important space to enable future collaborative approaches. I am truly impressed to hear about the biodiversity initiatives that are happening in many countries at country level. We need to scale up and transform these initiatives into structural changes to ensure the transformation we are striving to achieve. It is also important to highlight the work of our colleagues at the United Nations Environment Program, the IFED, uh, the World Bank, and many other organizations that are tech undertaking to tackle the key biodiversity issues in production systems. We need an enabling environment so that all countries can ensure that biodiversity is not only conserved and sustainably used, but used as a leverage to improve our productive systems. I would like to highlight the important role that FAO uh, plays and sincerely thank them for hosting our second meeting of the open-ended working group of the Global Biodiversity Framework that took place last year in Rome at FAO headquarters in February. That support, looking forward also in the implementation of post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, including through the strategy of mainstreaming biodiversity across agricultural sectors, as well as the 2021 20 and 2023 action plan to implement it will all be critical in guiding our parties in transforming their food system. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, as we move towards negotiating and adopting an ambitious post-2020 global biodiversity framework, it is imperative that we catalyze the role of biodiversity in supporting productive and sustainable food systems. The Das Gupta re uh, Review Report made it very clear that our economies, livelihood, and well-being all depend on our most precious asset, and that is nature. We could not ask for a better institutional alignment with our Conference of the Parties 15, the UN Food Systems Summit, in the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, setting the stage for the next decade of action. The responsibility is ours. I invite you to be bold, ambitious, and transformative as we strive to meet the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. If we all work together, living in harmony with nature will no longer be simply a vision but a reality for us and for the generations to come. Thank you, thank you very much. Back to you, David. Thank you very much indeed, um, Elizabeth, for those uh, encouraging and inspiring closing remarks. And now um, it's my honor together with uh, Eduardo uh, and uh, all our colleagues, uh, in FAO and all the participants around the world to, to close this global dialogue. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Ambassador Terry, uh, and uh, also uh, uh, Vladimir, and also Aguda Vilama, eh? <laughs> still there. And of course, uh, uh, Elizabeth, and all the colleagues uh, and the friends. Uh, we Thank need you. To